Welcome to Beyond the Red Carpet. Today, I am pleased to have back Lady Colin Campbell. Um, last time you were on, Lady C, every, I mean, our, our emails and everything just went crazy. We learned so much from you. So welcome back. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back. And I have to tell you, you look absolutely great. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, you always look great. So, I mean, I, I can repay the compliment every time I see you. Today, we're going to do something a little different because um, there's been so much about Harry and Meghan. Let's kind of leave them away for a while because people are learning so much from you about history and relationships. And I want to start off with um, just the sibling relationship of Harry and William as they were growing up and during the tumultuous time of uh, the Meghan entrance and where they stand now. Well, of course, you know, there's a two year age difference. I think it's two years and three months or nearly three months. So it's not a huge age difference, but as very young children, William was the bruiser and Harry was the gentle one. And then they sort of swapped roles when they were very young, since when Harry has been the bruiser and William has been the responsible one. And of course, they grew up knowing that William would be king and Harry wouldn't be king. And tellingly, Harry would say things like, oh, well, William, if you don't want to be king, that's okay. I'll be king instead of you. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was always very generous with, with uh, his desire to occupy his brother's shoes. But they got along very well. And uh, William, as he himself has said, protected Harry when they were growing up because Harry was always above a boy, as they would say in England, you know, he was always a bruiser. He always was tiresomely naughty. I mean, he'd been a very endearing child because he could be very affectionate. But as he grew older, uh, it wasn't mischievous so much as almost hurtful, hurtful. I mean, I can't get over him deliberately driving into the shin of the colonel, you know, and Diana remonstrating with him, but not punishing him. And I mean, you know, a child doesn't drive into someone's shin and think it's funny. Even a two or three year old child would know that's not funny. So, so, so what you're saying is he was never reprimanded at all for any of his bad deeds? No, I'm saying she would reprimand him but wouldn't punish him. And then she also did the fatal thing of saying to him, to both of them, it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you don't get caught. I mean, Joe Kennedy used to say that to the Kennedy boys as well. And he has quite justifiably been roundly criticized over the decades for encouraging amorality. Well, if Joe Kennedy was encouraging amorality, what was Diana doing by doing the same thing? I mean, William was lucky because he was going to be king he fell under the aegis of his grandmother who took him under her wing. And really because the queen had had a wonderful relationship with Queen Mary, who was her grandmother, who tucked her under her wing. And so the queen did the same thing, but primarily with William, not with Harry, because William, she's a very busy woman and she didn't have time to be pandering to all of the children, but she tried to get the children to be brought up with more discipline. And Diana was roundly resistant to, the, to what she regarded as oppressing them. 
Well, we see how that turned out. Um, okay, so as they were pretty, in, in, in their younger years, William and Harry were pretty close. Now let's compare and contrast that to the queen's father, who was never supposed to be king, and that's a George VI and his brother, Duke of Windsor, which was Edward VIII. How were they as they were growing up? Were they close like William and Harry were, or? Oh, they were very close, and they remained close until the abdication. Mm -hmm. It was only after the abdication that they ceased being close, but they were very close uh, until, really, until Edward VIII decided he wanted to marry Mrs. Simpson. And it's when Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who was then the Duchess of York, realized that the possibility of marriage was on the cards. And she was already having to cope with Princess Marina, the Duchess of Kent, who was beautiful, Princess Marina of Greece, beautiful and glamorous. And they used to call Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, when she was Duchess of York, the Dowdy Duchess. And she absolutely hated being overshadowed by Princess Marina. And they never really had a particularly close or good relationship. Then when, and she was perfectly happy, to the, she and, and the Prince of Wales, as Edward VIII was before he became king, and the Yorks were very close. Uh, they, they were on dropping in terms with each other. And one day, Queen El the Elizabeth York, as she then was, mm -hmm. dropped in on Fort Belvedere, which is where David and Wallace were. And she saw Wallace mimicking her, and she never forgave her for that. That, but she, bore it until she realized that, the, that Wallace was in line to become Duchess of Lancaster or Queen, at which point she moved heaven and earth to make sure that David, as the Duke of Windsor was known, would either give her up or abdicate because Elizabeth did not want to be shunted even further aside. She had a monumental ego and loved being the, I suppose she, it would, would have been the third, the second lady. The, well, there was Queen Mary. So Queen Mary was the first lady in the land. So she really was the second lady in the land. But the third lady in the land, who was Princess Marina, Duchess of Kent, had superseded her. And she couldn't bear the fact that two foreigners were going to come in and supersede her. So that's really when the relationship between the brothers started to get distant. And after the abdication, Elizabeth convinced her husband, who by then was George VI, that England could not have two kings resident in the one land, the present king and the previous king, and that he should remain exiled as far as she was concerned for the rest of his life, which is exactly what happened. So um, a woman actually was the impetus for the breakup between the two brothers there and the two brothers today. Is that correct? There are parallels, yes. Yes. Except that Elizabeth's impetus was uh, to get rid of Wallace. And if she couldn't get rid of Wallace, she was going to get rid of David. But she certainly wasn't going to allow David to marry Wallace and, and put her in, in front of Elizabeth. So yeah, she and she encouraged Bertie to really put a great distance emotionally as well as in every other way between him and his brother. I mean, she had some grounds for doing it, 
but she didn't have to do it to the extent she did. And history might have been quite different had she never done it because as David used to say when he was Duke of Windsor, had there been no Elizabeth, there would have been no abdication. And, and Meghan has certainly gone to, she has been, and, and incidentally, she and Elizabeth Boslan were born on the same day, date, the 4th of August. They're both 4th of August products. Let's put it that way. And I think that Meghan has certainly been a very divisive, but you see there are substantial differences as well, because Elizabeth was very pro-royalist, pro the royal family. She had reverence for the royal family. She loved being a member of the royal family. Meghan has had no reverence, indeed respect for the royal family. She thought she was going to come here and you know, well, I've arrived, I'm a star of soups, I'm a fabulous creature, you know, come on, and, you know, you've got to get with the program, you've got to all do what I want, because I'm just the hottest thing since sliced bread. And of course, it hasn't worked like that. But yeah, it's uh, definitely hasn't worked like that. Um, we know all over the, the news and the internet, everything. Harry and Meghan both are throwing the royals under the bus and criticizing them at every turn. Did that happen with the Duke of Windsor? Was he, did he criticize his family and the monarchy when he was exiled at all? Were there any not shades of it? Not publicly. And privately, he was always agitating for the Duchess to be made a royal highness. And it mattered to him greatly that she had not been made a royal highness. And it should have mattered to him greatly because he gave up his throne because he was told in Britain, there is no such thing as a morganatic marriage. You your wife has to be equal to you. And then he gives up his throne because they're telling him he can't make her Duchess of Lancaster and she's not suitable to be queen. So he gives up his throne and then they're not equal because she is prevented from using the title Royal Highness, which is actually something he was born with. And he actually tried to get Lord Simon to deal with this through the courts. And then he was told it was going to be too damaging to the monarchy. So he withdrew dealing with it through the courts. But he was agitating thereafter for the rest of his life for her to be given what he regarded. And I have to say, I think he was right. Her rightful rank. She was his wife. She should be his equal. I mean, you can't be... The, the rationale that they used was completely fallacious. And he did not brief against the royal family publicly. He did write an autobiography, which was measured in its justification of his conduct, as opposed to critical of the family or the institution. But privately to people, he you know, he made no secret of the fact that he thought that Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was an absolute witch, beginning with <laughs> B. <laughs> and that oh, she was extremely ambitious and that Queen Mary had gone along with it, partly because she had a hyper-referential attitude towards royalty. And he felt that Queen Mary, but by the, by the end of the war, Queen Mary had come around to wanting a rapprochement, but it never happened. And it never happened as long as David was alive. And Elizabeth spent her whole life saying that Wallace was the lowest of the low and Wallace should never be a part of the family. And David used to say, 
she's jealous because I spurned her when she wanted me. And she's jealous of Wallace and his rationale has merit because as soon as he was dead, Elizabeth tried to befriend Wallace and used to send her flowers every week. And Wallace would throw them in the bin and say that they belong there with the rubbish, just like Elizabeth, and, you know. And But she had weekly overtures to Wallace until Wallace lost her mind. And she would try the nonsense about, oh, we're two widows together. And Wallace thought, no, this doesn't make sense. I mean, but Elizabeth might not have known what David said, but I knew because, of course, David said it to people who I knew. John Pringle, Margaret Argyle. I mean, they weren't saying it to Elizabeth, so she might have thought her great charm and and seductive skills would have worked with Wallace, but they didn't, because Wallace knew exactly what she was up to. Right. Well, you were talking about the Queen Mother Elizabeth. I don't want people to get confused yeah. that it was Queen Elizabeth's Queen Mother. Uh, but now let's let's go to spares because um, there's been much uh, talk about Harry being the spare, so he doesn't really have a role. The same thing with Margaret, but she still had a reverence to the royals, so she wouldn't um, come out. Yes, she wouldn't come out and mock them or, but she did leave a rather um, bohemian life is the word that they always describe her. Uh, how does she compare with Harry other than the fact that uh, she liked and loved and adored the royals and he has but the opposite she, view? She doesn't, she doesn't compare with Harry at all. I mean, she, in fact, when she was she was shoved out of being a council of state because she lost her place in the top six in the line of succession, she was really upset because she liked doing royal duties. And yes, she was bohemian. Yes, she was a bit of a maverick. In her private life, she liked being entertained and being entertaining. I mean, I, some of her friends were some of my friends. When I was young, I was very friendly with Charles Delevingne and Ned Ryan, who were two of her closest friends. Charles's daughter is that Delevingne girl who's the top model. What is her name? Chloe um, something. Cara, I Cara Delevingne, okay. Cara. Yeah, so, you know, Princess Margaret all, and, and Ned Ryan had a stand in Portobello. And, you know, Princess Margaret liked interesting people. She was intelligent, she was fun. Roddy Llewellyn was a friend of mine. Uh, John Rendell was a friend of mine, all of whom were in the circus. Sarah Pansonby, who owned uh, the house that, Prince, that they all, it was, they, they were all there together. I forget what it was called now. Surrender or something. Uh, you know, Sarah was a friend of mine. Uh, so Princess Margaret liked really interesting people. And they didn't have to have a grand position. They simply had to be nice and interesting and entertaining. And she liked them, which I think is very commendable. I mean, Harry was more like Princess Margaret before he met Meghan. You know, he had an interesting circle of friends who were not always from the top drawer, but they were certainly fun. And, and uh, it's after he met Meghan that everybody got iced because they, Meghan didn't like the fact that they had a sense of humor and they joke. And, you know, she's far too grand and serious to ever make a joke unless she's doing a sort of girly girly stupidity that's going to appeal to the Priyanka Chopras and Serena Williamses of this world. Yeah. <laughs> well, a break. we know that Charles is, and William, but especially Charles is taking on more and more duties 
is he basically uh, a regent without being uh, called yes. a regent? Well, yes and no. It's it's a soft regency, but it's been a soft regency. I mean, COVID interfered with things somewhat, but the intention was just before COVID that the Queen would hand over more and more to him quietly. What she has done is she's handed over a lot of the duties and engagements and things that are very public to both him and William, actually. So, so people will get used to the fact that they are there and that they are the next generation so that when she dies, it's not such a big shock that, you know, people don't think, well, is it Prince of Wales, Prince William, are they going to be good kings? People will already have been sufficiently familiar with them in kingly roles. So it's a soft regency, but in terms, and, and my understanding is that a lot of her papers, copies are sent to Charles as well. So he's up on the nitty gritty as well, but she is the one who makes all the decisions. She is the one who still has control and power in her hands. So she has not relegated responsibility so much as invited in people who will be that much more visible. And, but it's a soft regency, but it's not a hard regency because Charles has to defer to Mama. Okay, well, um, as we know recently, uh, the queen has stated her desire that Camillo will be queen consort. Yeah. That raised a lot of, of concerns with people, but you know, Camilla has been, you know, she she has come around. They have redone her profile. She, people have really come to know her. There's a marvelous there's a marvelous um, documentary on true royalty about reinventing the royals and how the press and how they came about re redoing her image so that people would like her and not see her as as Diana called her the Rottweiler. I guess it was. Yeah. But in your book, in your book, Diana in private. You did mention that during their um, Charles and Diana's engagement, Charles did say whatever love means when they asked if they were in love. Did he, were, what was the rumblings around the palace before, uh, after well, that? that? Had, did he that ever had, say anything? That had absolute, his comment had absolutely nothing to do with saying, they asked if he was, if they were in love. And Charles is a very spiritual, questing, questioning person. Quite frankly, he complicates things sometimes rather more than I would do. But he wasn't trying to say, he, what he was trying to say was, I am, in, I am in love with her up to a point. We don't know each other that well. I would not, have met, be, I would not be marrying her if I didn't think that I will be fully in love with her. She has indicated that she is going to be a wonderful, supportive wife, mother and queen. And we are going to face this lifelong challenge in tandem. That's rarely what he was saying. And, as, and that in love doesn't mean you know, Hollywood, and you take out the valins, and, you know, uh, somebody comes home, and you can't make it to the lift, because they've got to be jacked up against the wall, and uh, a Meghan Markle scene from Suits takes place in reality. Uh, that's what he was trying to say. And he and Camilla were not the great, I didn't have the great love that they now have. I've said it repeatedly. Their great love came about after the breakup of his marriage and the fracturing of hers because Andrew Parker Bowles was a great swordsman. And when 
Camilla and Charles were having an amitié amoureuse, he was having a torrid romance with Charlotte Soames. Charlotte Soames, who was by then, if I'm not mistaken, Charlotte Hamblo, because Rupert, her ex-husband, lived around the corner from me. And this was at the time of the Zimbabwe independence. Mm -hmm. And, but it was, and she and Charles did not see each other in that way and had practically no connection for the next, I think it's about, well, from, it was from the marriage until da he discovered that Diana was having an affair with Barry Manneke. Mm -hmm. And remember, I'm the person in that book who revealed that Diana was having an affair with Barry Manneke. And when I revealed it, everybody poured scorn on me and said I was a fantasist and I didn't know what I was speaking about until Diana herself confirmed it. So uh, I knew what I was speaking about because I got a lot of my information from Diana herself, but I couldn't say it at the time. But it's after both marriages broke down, <coughs> sorry, that Charles and, and Charles incidentally, in the early days of the breakdown of the marriage, had several love interests. He had, he had a flirtation with Ava O'Neill, whose son Christopher is married to Princess Madeline of Sweden now. I've known Ava forever. And Ava ticked me off for hints for writing about it in that book. Uh, he had a, uh, a step out with, with Dale Tryon again, according to Dale. Uh, I think she made it rather more important than it was. But so it wasn't, but Camilla, the, the relationship with Camilla narrowed down, solidified, intensified, and grew out of the anguish as his world was collapsing and his reputation had been trashed by Diana. Remember, Diana tried to destroy his reputation and prevent him from acceding to the throne. She tried it in the Martin Bashir interview. She tried to get him knocked out of the line of succession so that William could be king because Martin Bashir had told her that the queen was dying and she believed it. And so she thought if William is, is William will have to be king if Charles is knocked out of the line of succession. So I'll be regent. That was yeah. her thinking. Uh, and you know, the whole thing is, it's, it was a can of worms, but built on a series of, of misapprehensions and falsehoods, many of which were directly due to the, the lies Martin Bashir told her, but also the lies that Diana herself told about Charles and Camilla. You know, Diana and I fell out when I was writing that book because I was supposed, she wanted me to do what Morton did for her. And, but she made the fatal mistake of changing her story midstream. She had already told me the truth. Then she needed to backtrack on it because I would imagine some friend of hers had said, you know, Diana, Nobody's going to care that you don't like the men in suits and you want your freedom and liberty and you want a daughter and so you want to get married again. You know, the, the, the factory worker in Dagnum who has to be on a factory line to earn a living wage is going to think you're a spoiled brat and have no sympathy for you. So Diana came up with, oh, I'm Charles's victim and Camilla's this horrid person which she hadn't said or thought before it became convenient for her to say it. Well, that kind of sounds like what's going on now with Meghan and Harry playing the victim. Unfortunately, the time has gone. Where did it go? Uh, I, I haven't even gotten through half my questions for you. So we will have you back 
in, in a few months. You did say you would come back again in a few months, uh, your time permitting. It's, it's just so fascinating how much you can um, teach us about what's going on now, what has happened in the future, and tell us all these things that we don't know, especially over here. We're not privy to a lot of the, a lot of the inside scoops that you are. And I'm glad that you are here with us and can fill us in as time goes by. So again, thank you, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. God bless. Take care. Thank you. We will next see you soon. Yeah, next oh. time when we take another look. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Again, my thanks to Lady Colin Campbell, Lady C. She is a phenomenal wealth of information, and I look forward to having her back again in a few months to bring us up to date on more things royal. So I will see you next time when we take another look beyond the red carpet. With over 30 years of experience in real estate in the mortgage industry, Darlene Mays provides knowledge and expert guidance to clients looking to buy or sell a home. Serving clients throughout South Orange County, Darlene specializes in the senior community of Laguna Woods Village. Darlene works with her clients to ensure the highest level of service, from the beginning of the process right down to the closing table. If you are looking to buy or sell, who you work with really does matter. Call Darlene Mays today.